Welcome to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I'm Marty Peterson, your host. I have spent over 20 years studying antimicrobial resistance, which is a topic of today's webinar. We are very pleased to have with us today, Dr. Jeffrey Klausner. He will be presenting his webinar titled, Addressing Untreatable Gonorrhea Resistance Guided Therapy. It's a very important and very timely topic. Before we begin today, I'd just like to thank our participants for joining us today and give you a little bit of background of Dr. Klausner in case you're unaware of all his significant accomplishments. He's a physician and also has a master's in public health. He's board certified internist and infectious disease specialist and an internationally recognized policy and program expert in preventing and controlling sexually transmitted diseases. He has been working on STD prevention and control since 1995. He has more than 500 peer-reviewed publications in the area of sexually transmitted, infect transmitted diseases. And these areas include the prevention, the control, epidemiology, diagnosis, management, and treatment. He has a particular focus on viruses, including human papillomavirus, herpes simplex virus, as well as syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. He was a U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Epidemic Service Officer from 1995 to 1997. Dr. Klausner has led numerous successful policy and programmatic initiatives to prevent and control STDs in California. From 1998 to 2009, he was Deputy Health Officer and Director of STD Prevention and Control Services for the San Francisco Department of Public Health, Medical Director of the San Francisco City STD Clinic, and the President of this California STD Controllers Association. In 1995, he left California and rejoined the CDC as a medical officer and branch chief for the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, HIV and tuberculosis program in South Africa. He later returned to California in 2011, where he became a professor of medicine and public health at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he is today. Since his return, he has been an active member in the World Health Organization STD Treatment Guidelines Working Group and the Infectious Disease Society of America Working Group on STDs. He has also recently been appointed to the CDC STD Treatment Guidelines Work Group on Gonorrhea, and perhaps he can update us on some of his activities there later in, during the Q&A or presentation. So very, very um, significant background in this area, and we're very lucky to have him to speak with us today. For our participants, I just want you to be aware, uh, this is a live webinar, we are recording, all lines are muted. We, engage, we want you to engage with Dr. Klausner today, so please send us any comments, questions via the chat box. You'll see there's the Zoom webinar chat box in the lower right-hand corner. So with that, welcome to our participants and welcome to Dr. Klausner, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Marnie. I'm really happy to be able to share with the audience today um, an area that I've actually been uh, working on since the early uh, 2000s is how we can develop a smarter precision therapy for the uh, treatment of gonorrhea. And with the recent increases in drug resistant gonorrhea, um, the time is no better than now. So I'm gonna be uh, presenting um, a talk called Addressing Untreatable Gonorrhea Resistance Guided Therapy. And again, if anyone has any questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free to uh, participate in the chat. So um, I do work with a variety of different uh, commercial entities and uh, manufacturers now, mostly in the uh, laboratory diagnostics area, and I do receive um, variety of different federal grants for uh, my research activities. So I always like to start with a case. This is a true case that was reported uh, a couple years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. This case uh, began in December 2014. A heterosexual man uh, went to a UK sexual health clinic, complained about two weeks of urogenital symptoms. Ten days prior, he had returned from Japan 
where his Japanese female partner had been treated for gonorrhea. His lab results in the UK clinic, he had, had a, a nucleic acid amplification test or a NAT that was NG positive in his urine. He also had an NG positive urethral culture and an NG positive uh, NAT test from his pharynx. At the time, the recommended treatment in the UK was dual therapy with ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams intramuscular and azithromycin one gram orally was found his NG strain that was cultured from his urethra was resistant to cefiroxime, the second generation cephalosporin, ciprofloxacin, and tetracycline. On follow-up, uh, two weeks later, and in the UK, their standard of practice is to do a repeat pharyngeal swab. His uh, NAT was still positive. He denied any sexual contact after treatment. He had another repeat uh, pharyngeal swab uh, nearly three months later. It was still positive. Uh, two weeks after that, another repeat and a culture at this time. Uh, both were positive, and he was treated with a double dose of ceftriaxone, one gram, and azithromycin, uh, two grams. And until now, that's been our standard uh, recommendation for the treatment of potential drug-resistant uh, serial gonorrhea infections is to double the recommended dose. And now finally, um, two weeks after that, his pharyngeal swab was negative. When they looked at his day 98 uh, culture, they saw now the infection was resistant to multiple um, cephalosporins, including the third generation cephalosporin, ceftriaxone and cefixime and cefotaxime. Um, other antimicrobials and other classes, such as azithromycin, penicillin, tetracycline, and ciprofloxacin. And the only um, thing this organism was susceptible to was spectinomycin, which is available in Europe, but not available in the United States. And then interestingly, uh, when they looked at the different um, antibiotic uh, molecular or the enzyme targets, and I'll get into this in much more detail as we get into the presentation, but there were alterations in the, in the PEN-A gene, and we call a mosaic PEN-A gene with some alterations in the PEN-A sequences, and uh, that PEN-A gene is what produces the penicillin binding protein, which is the target for cefixime and ceftriaxone. There also were alterations in the MTR uh, promoter gene, which results in an increased pump or efflux of antibiotics like ceftriaxone and azithromycin. And then there was another gene target alteration in the PEN-B gene, which um, causes a, a decrease in influx of the antibiotics ceftriaxone and azithromycin. And I, I like this case because it really starts to help us understand what the different targets of antibiotics are and how um, resistance occurs. So in the United States in 2012, the CDC first reported in the New England Journal of Medicine an increase of the percentage of isolates with elevated minimum inhibitory concentrations or MICs of suffixing. And you can see while, while low, the y-axis goes from zero to 5%, and across the x-axis you see the year, but you see a substantial increase in the uh, percentage of Neisseria gonorrhea isolates that have decreased or elevated MIC from uh, less than 1% to nearly 5%, particularly in men who have sex with men and in Western states like California, Oregon, and Washington. And for reasons we don't fully understand, um, that's generally what we see is the first introduction of resistance in men who have sex with men and also in states in the um, western part of the country. But you can also see um, you know, a, a subtle but uh, slow rise in um, other parts of the country and in other populations as well. So when the CDC um, identified this trend, um, what they do is they uh, write an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine and they sound the alarm. They start off the editorial and say it's time to sound the alarm. So now the alarm has been sounded and that gets picked up by a variety of, um, of media and social media, gets uh, identified as a uh, super bug, it gets declared as an emergency, 
and um, there's a lot of um, awareness and uh, reaction to this um, uh, potential public health threat or public health uh, crisis. And this was in um, summer of 2012. And it's just important to remember that 40 years ago, if you look at uh, the front page of the New York Times or the uh, New York Post, you can see similar headlines about uh, drug resistant strains, about incurable, incurable uh, VD, new gonorrhea fears. So this is not particularly new. And when we look back at the introduction of antibiotics uh, since the early 1930s, you can see um, the timeline from when an antibiotic is introduced to when the first resistance in that antibiotic is reported in Neisseria gonorrhea. So sulfa medications took about five years, penicillins 14 years, other penicillins uh, through other mechanisms about 30 years, tetracyclines, ceftriaxone took about 30 years, uh, Cipro was actually pretty quick, but it's been a, a, a steady uh, process of introducing a new antibiotic and uh, seeing resistance. And the problem now is our antibiotic pipeline uh, particularly for gonorrhea is uh, very dry. So we don't have new antibiotics that we can just start um, addressing uh, um, resistant infections. And because of that, in 2014, the uh, CDC declared Neisseria gonorrhea as one of the top three antibiotic resistant threats along with uh, C. difficile, and carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, or uh, CRE. And um, the uh, good thing about that declaration is it does start to mobilize resources and start to mobilize investment in uh, research and uh, development. Now this slide uh, shows us um, the different targets of, of antibiotics and um, the different potential resistance mechanism. So if we um, look at the um, highlighted area in the red box, that's where fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin work on the gyrase um, A enzyme, which is um, how uh, DNA becomes a helical molecule. And by, in, by the ciprofloxacin inhibition of that helicase or gyrase A enzyme, then um, the DNA of the organism uh, cannot be created. Other antibiotics also, uh, like spectinomycin or macrolides, also work on protein synthesis. And then um, you can see on the cell wall on the right, antibiotics like beta-lactams, which are penicillins and cephalosporins, um, they, they work on uh, different um, cell wall proteins that are critical for uh, maintenance of the organism. And by knowing where the antibiotics work in the life cycle of the cell, it helps us um, then move to predict what gene alterations might be associated with resistance and with uh, gene sequencing or whole genome sequencing, we can have a better understanding of the likelihood that that particular organism will be susceptible or resistant. And that's really the crux of this new uh, foundation for precision guided therapy or smart therapy for uh, bacterial infections. And we've, um, ex we've known about that for HIV for 20 years. We look at resistance genotypes in HIV. It helps guide our HIV therapy. Um, somewhat with tuberculosis, uh, we've been doing that as well. And then uh, other organisms, this is our kind of our new direction of using the uh, sequences to predict susceptibility. Now, is this relevant in gonorrhea? And in 2016, you can see while there is a, um, a fair proportion of gonorrhea in the United States that's resistant to different antibiotics, if you look overall on your right side of this pie chart, you can see that more than half of gonorrhea is, is susceptible to anything. And if you actually add up the ciprofloxacin susceptibility, 73% of cases in 2016 were susceptible to ciprofloxacin. But our practice has been to treat every case the same way. And at the time it was with dual therapy, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. So we're essentially treating it with a sledgehammer instead of being smarter 
and um, be more precise and be able to use uh, different antibiotics for the different um, characteristics of gonorrhea infections that individuals might have. So uh, I thought, you know, there might be a smarter or better way to address this. So because we know that um, the gy gyrase A or that um, uh, protein, um, that enzyme is the target of ciprofloxacin, and when um, the organism is susceptible to ciprofloxacin, you see that in, in A, that the ciprofloxacin binds into this enzyme pocket and then inhibits the activity of the enzyme. Now, when the enzyme is altered, as in B, essentially ciprofloxacin doesn't bind to the enzyme and ciprofloxacin has no efficacy. And then when we looked at that enzyme, we actually were uh, surprised to see a single point mutation that um, in the sequence of that enzyme is a single change from the uh, nucleotide uh, uh, C to T. And with that single change, um, that was what conferred resistance to ciprofloxacin. So when we looked at this further across a variety of different isolates uh, from around the country, around the world, we actually were able to uh, determine that this mutation in codon 91 is both necessary and sufficient for resistance. So that single point mutation in and of itself was necessary and sufficient to generate resistance. And the wild type or the naturally occurring unmutated gene was 98% percent uh, sensitive and 98 percent specific for um, for resistance so if the wild type was present we could highly reliably predict that um, the the phenotype would be um, uh, susceptible at, um, as well so based on that uh, at the laboratory in san francisco when i was in san francisco department of public health in the early 2000s we were to develop a uh, PCR-based uh, assay based on um, the kind of uh, binding and lack of binding of different primers at different uh, uh, temperatures. And that is shown on the right. And you can see that the um, resistant uh, gene has a different temperature curve and uh, melting peak than the susceptible gene. And by using the software in the uh, PCR machine, we're able to differentiate between the um, wild type and the um, resistant gene. And then when we looked at that over 100 different um, isolates, you could see an excellent discriminatory capacity of this PCR assay, which was able to uh, correctly predict the uh, low MIC on the left. And you can see those black bars are the wild type or gyrus A, and the white bars of the uh, mutant um, on the right, and in this study, actually only one uh, of, of the 100 plus were uh, misidentified. So that leads us to this concept of molecular-based susceptibility testing, or what now is uh, starting to be called resistance-guided therapy. And with the rapid detection of Neisseria gonorrhea, the detection of key antimicrobial resistant genes, it enables us to do targeted treatment. Therefore, we can reduce antibiotic selection pressure. And the hypothesis there is that with um, a variety of different antibiotics, instead of one single antibiotic, we can slow down the emergence of resistance. So in order to uh, start to test this hypothesis, we had to um, uh, develop an actual assay for clinical use. So we had to verify that assay in accordance with CLIA regulations. So our clinical laboratory at UCLA could offer the assay in uh, clinical practice. So we did precision studies, which are basically um, repeating the assay in um, in uh, triplicates, and we found no difference in any triplicates in the assay performance. Also importantly, because we are using clinical specimens um, in clinical practice, we're not using isolates, and as people know, got, um, culture for gonorrhea is not commonly used, but we use and collect clinical specimens that can get tested with nucleic acid amplification tests. We had to make sure there was no cross-reactivity with other common Neisseria species. So Neisseria meningitidis, which is a common 
organism that can occur in the throat, other Neisseria species that can be in the throat or rectum or urogenital uh, specimens as well. And importantly, there was zero no fluorescent signal or no uh, cross reactivity. So after that verification in November 2015, we introduced use of the assay and we would do what we call reflex gyrase genotyping on all Neisseria gonorrhea nucleic acid positive specimens. So we didn't necessarily have to test every specimen, but only the positive specimens, and that's a much more cost-effective uh, way to potentially um, use this uh, test and, do, and use this um, algorithm. And this was um, in UCLA Health, which has two hospitals, uh, multiple primary care clinics and specialty clinics serving over half a million people in Southern California. As part of the introduction, we uh, provided uh, laboratory results um, on, our, on our EHR, electronic health record, which went directly back to the uh, providers. And you can see that um, the top of the result, they would say now Siri gonna read PCR result positive, um, reporting um, reminders, reference range. And then uh, what's new here is we say the wild type gyrase gene was detected for this Neisseria gonorrhea, predicted to be susceptible to ciprofloxacin, recommended dose for treatment is Cipro 500 uh, orally once based on uh, prior experience with Cipro for susceptible infections. And then a disclaimer that the um, assay is, is used in compliance with CLIA, but it's not FDA approved for marketing. So then to study the impact of the introduction of the genotyping, we wanted to um, um, evaluate uh, patient outcomes and also evaluate what clinicians were using to treat gonorrhea during the uh, study period. So we did a retrospective review. We reviewed records for all laboratory confirmed Neisseria gonorrhea cases between January 2015 and September 2017, so nearly a two year period. We also collected test secure data among uh, patients with wild type Neisseria gonorrhea infections who were treated with Cipro. Remember, test secure is not recommended, it's not routine clinical practice, but occasionally uh, people will request a test secure, or providers will do a test secure, or people will have a um, follow up test um, within a brief uh, period that we might consider a uh, test of cure. When we looked at this 32 month study period, there were 538 NG infected patients um, who had 590 cases. So there were some repeat cases of, of Neisseria gonorrhea in some patients at a variety of uh, and large number of different anatomic uh, sites at 655 different anatomic sites, which includes the pharynx, the rectum, the cervix, the uh, urethra. Now, when people are symptomatic or their contacts of gonorrhea, it's recommended they get treated on the day of presentation. So in our setting, about 40% of people are treated empirically on the same day. So in that group, uh, test results are not gonna have any impact on treatment selection. But it still leaves us 60% of people who are treated after specimen collection. And the average time from specimen collection to treatment among non-empirically treated cases was five days. So we actually have a uh, fairly good window of time in order to uh, treat people based on the laboratory results. And you can see among those 655 infections, the gyrase results, about 43% were wild type, 27% were mutant, but importantly, uh, nearly a third were indeterminate. And it has to do with a uh, low bacterial burden particularly in uh, the pharynx um, where people are being screened for infection, but the amount of bacterial burden may actually be very low. But you can see when we just look at the uh, ratio of the wild type to mutants, it's about two to one. So about 60 to 70% of the time when we do have a result, people do have a, a wild type infection. We look at the uh, distribution of gyrase genotypes by anatomic site. 
you can see um, blue is the unable to genotype, so that occurred most commonly in the pharyngeal specimens. But you look at traditional urogenital specimens or rectal specimens, you can see more than 80% of the time we do get a genotype result. When we do, um, it is more common to have wild type than uh, non wild type or mutant. Importantly, one of our study outcomes was to look at the frequency of ceftriaxone use. So prior to the introduction of genotyping, about 94% of cases were treated with ceftriaxone. However, after genotyping, that went down um, by 18%, about 76% were uh, treated with ceftriaxone, and that includes the 40% of people who were treated uh, empirically. So this was actually a, a nice uh, substantial decline in the um, proportion of individuals who were treated with just one antibiotic, and now um, we see that people are treated with um, uh, more than one um, uh, antibiotic when they have the uh, information. And over time, in the next slide, you can see an increase in ciprofloxacin use uh, for the Neisseria gonorrhea infections by quarter um, among those who are non empirically treated. So, about 40 to 50 percent of cases um, by the end of the study period could be treated with ciprofloxacin. And just a small note in uh, the middle of 2016, we, we did add an additional electronic reminder. Uh, two providers um, in case they were missing that bright yellow uh, laboratory report just to remind them that they could treat patients uh, with ciprofloxacin on the basis of that test result. Now importantly, additionally, we wanted to look at uh, the cure in the number of people who did have a uh, test to cure. So the next slide shows you um, small number of patients who had tested cure. So there were only 25 um, infections which had a follow-up test to cure, but importantly, 100% were cured regardless of their anatomic site and infection. So, uh, you know, we did have prior data showing, knowing that ciprofloxacin was highly efficacious in a variety of different anatomic sites, and these data uh, further confirm that. So from this UCLA gyrase study, we can conclude that routine gyrase genotyping can be implemented in large health system. Gyrase results can impact treatment on Neisseria gonorrhea. We saw that ceftriaxone use decreased with an increase in ciprofloxacin use, and it can be further enhanced with electronic uh, reminders. And in the small sample of tested cure uh, patients, it was 100%. Limitations from this study included was a single center study, further implementation and replication of the gyrase assay are, want, are warranted. As I mentioned, the test secure sample was small and there was no measure of ecologic impact. So ultimately we're trying to see if this strategy can have an impact on the um, emergence of cephalosporin resistance, particularly ceftriaxone resistance over time, but this study was not uh, set up to do that. So I told you there was a phase one, which we developed and verified the assay. Phase two, which was um, introduction and evaluation of the assay in a, a clinical setting. And then phase three is actually a formal uh, clinical study. We call it a clinical validation. And this is supported by the um, NIH and the STAR STI clinical trials group. And this was a clinical study of the gyrase PCR assay in 108 Neisseria gyrase wild type culture positive patients treated with Cipro with a culture tested cure at five to seven days. So this is the most rigorous way to uh, look at the um, impact of the assay with Cipro treatment. Uh, the study has been fully enrolled. Um, the uh, preliminary results are, <clears throat> I guess I can say, very highly promising. They were shared last week at the CDC treatment guidelines, and um, it, it is likely, um, although I can't say with 100% certainty yet, but it's likely that uh, this approach will be included as an option in how to m manage um, gonorrhea in the future. So going back to um, our, our kind of
image of gonor of resistance. Um, I talked initially about for clinolone resistance and the gyrus A, but uh, one issue is that in most of the world, actually, ciprofloxacin is um, cannot be used. There's over 90% resistance to ciprofloxacin in, in Asia, and particularly uh, in China and in Southeast Asia. And we're lucky in the United States that 70 to 80% of cases are fluoroquinolone susceptible. But because of the absence of fluoroquinolone susceptibility in, in the rest of in many parts of the world, we need other targets and other kinds of assays that can predict um, susceptibility, particularly to cephalosporins like uh, suffixine. So that's what's highlighted here is the penicillin binding uh, proteins that are um, made by the pen gene which when altered can confer decreased susceptibility or resistance to third generation cephalosporins. <clears throat> and the way these uh, organisms uh, become resistant to cephalosporins is they actually uh, transfer genetic elements from a, resistance or a resistant organism, most commonly other Neisseria species, so as you know, our throats contain a variety of Neisseria species. It's kind of normal part of the microbiome. We get exposed to antibiotics, which we take either for a, a true indication, uh, such as a bacterial infection, or maybe a softer indication, like an upper respiratory tract infection. Those Neisseria in our throat, which are normally there, become uh, resistant. There's selection for resistance from those organisms. And then when someone acquires a new gonorrhea infection, then those genetic elements get swapped. Now, serogonorrhea is known to be particularly uh, promiscuous, if you will, and has a lot of transformative capacity. So it takes in new genetic elements from um, other bacteria in its um, environment. And that's one of the major ways we believe that antibiotics contribute to the development of resistance in uh, gonorrhea, particularly for uh, cephalosporins. So a couple of years ago, we looked at that PENA gene and we wanted to see, okay, what are the elements that PENA gene can be used to predict suffixing susceptibility? So we looked at 684 Neisseria gonorrhea isolates in, in California, and 29 of those had um, alert values or uh, decreased susceptibility to uh, cephalosporins like suffixing. And they all had, all 29 had the single uh, mutation type. It's not a point mutation, it's um, a few different mutations that are called the mosaic 34 penne allele. And we looked at the wild type penne, there was no cephalosporin resistance. So very similar to the Cipro story with Jarez A. Now we have a new story in uh, penne gene that there seems to be a strong association between a few genetic markers in the gene and cephalosporin resistance to the antibiotic uh, suffixing. And we um, developed the um, assay similarly to what we did before. We found it was 97% sensitive and 100% specific for predicting um, at least one minimum inhibitory concentration above the uh, CDC alert value. And we're able to develop an assay that could be multiplexed with the previously validated gyrase A assay so now we have a multiplex assay that ultimately will give providers the op multiple options to treat with either Cipro, to treat with oral suffixime, and potentially in the future other uh, antibiotics as well. Because that prior work was limited to isolates in the United States, we wanted to make sure globally we were not missing um, any unique uh, resistance patterns in that PENA gene. So we um, actually looked at uh, 415 different sequences from around the world, and we're able to identify that the change in the mosaic, plus just three more uh, codons, so really just six codons overall, were re highly reliable to be, be able to predict NG suffixing resistance with a sensitivity of 99.5%. So um, I thought that was pretty amazing that with just such a parsimonious few number of, gene, of um, codon alterations. So these aren't gene alterations, this is a single gene, and in just six codons, it's sufficient to predict 
uh, sensitive, uh, susceptibility um, at a sensitivity of 99.5%. Uh, so in summary, um, multi-drug resistant gonorrhea um, is, is here. It's um, been reported in uh, Canada. It's um, in North America. It's been well described in the United Kingdom. In Asia, we have new genotypic diagnostics to predict uh, susceptibility. There are two uh, commercial uh, entities now. There's one out of um, Australia called Speedix, which has um, approval for marketing in Australia and also has um, approval for marketing a CE mark in uh, Europe. And they are doing studies uh, or planning on studies in the United States to make it available in the United States. And then there's a second company called Shield Diagnostics in California, which offers the Gyreze uh, test um, in a combination platform with um, another manufacturer's assay. And the research is uh, continuing fairly rapidly to develop more multi-targeted and integrated um, Nasiri gonorrhea detection systems that will be able to give providers um, in real time and faster turnaround more antibiotic choices for when they treat um, gonorrhea. Um, my group has had um, a lot of success with um, disseminating uh, the information with a variety of different uh, publications. I encourage people interested in this topic to uh, review, and certainly I'd be happy to uh, share those with anyone who's interested. And I want to thank um, the variety of different students and um, researchers and collaborators at UCLA Health, um, physicians, patients, and laboratory staff, uh, Romney hum Humphreys, who was the chief of our microbiology laboratory at the time, um, SO, who's the uh, clinical microbiologist at University of Washington, and Mark Pandori, who's the chief of microbiology at Alameda County now, who helped with the initial development of the assays in the early uh, 2000s. A lot of this work has been supported um, with funds by the um, NIH. And so I think thank uh, you and our fellow taxpayers for supporting the uh, research. And I think we are uh, ending there. So uh, thank you very much. And let's open it up to some questions. Thank you, Dr. Klausner. That's a very interesting update on the, I guess the trends are where, um, treatment for Neisseria gonor gonorrhea is um, progressing towards. Um, yeah, so I want our participants to, and our attendees, please stay on the line because I think we've got um, some interesting questions here. And I also encourage those that haven't submitted a question, please do so via the chat box. Um, I wanted to just kind of go back and just talk about the current treatment guidelines. So, uh, the most recent one's 2015, and I know you've, you've been on a working group to, to consider changes to those or updates. Um, but I guess the ceftriaxone with azithromycin was somewhat of standard of care, correct? So this is very much um, would start to drive or shift the thinking around that. Yeah, so uh, we met in Atlanta uh, last week. I'm probably not at liberty to share all the discussions, but um, there was definitely a lot of concern um, in the group about the continued emergence of azithromycin resistance and decreased susceptibility to azithromycin. Um, many guideline groups around the world have updated their guidelines to eliminate azithromycin in co-treatment. Um, the United Kingdom or BASH, British Association for STDs and Sexual Health, now recommends one gram of, sac of ceftriaxone alone. Um, other countries in Asia and Southeast Asia um, recommend one gram of uh, ceftriaxone. You know, our recommendation, um, and it's still our recommendation, is ceftriaxone 250 milligrams plus azithromycin. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we do see an increase in that. And then, um, you know, what we will do with the addition of azithromycin, um, I guess, remains uncertain. Uh, but with these resistance-guided um, uh, assays or opportunities, um, I think we will see uh, opportunities for where providers have access to this testing. And of course, like everything else in the world, it becomes an access issue. 
And with no uh, FDA approved assay yet, um, it does limit the access uh, somewhat. But again, there are commercial manufacturers and there are large laboratories that um, are in the process of bringing this on. So people who know the laboratory diagnostic world know there's something called an LDT, or laboratory, um, laboratory developed test. And many of the larger laboratories like LabCorp, Quest, um, Mayo, uh, Clinic, uh, MTL, they can create their own laboratory developed tests. They can do the uh, performance assessments and such as sensitivity, specificity, et cetera. And, it's all, and that will enables them to comply with CLIA, and then they can make those laboratory tests available to clinicians. And they often will do that when there's a demand. So that's kind of my job now is to educate clinicians and to make people aware of this strategy so then they can go to their laboratories and say, hey, have you heard about this? You know, this would make it much easier for us to treat our patients. We could just use a single oral dose of ciprofloxacin. Instead of having to call people back for an injection, it would save us a lot of time and money. It would save the patient's time and money. And also it would make it much easier to treat partners. So right now a big problem in the United States is while we recommend expedited partner therapy or EPT, it's hard to wrap your head around about how do we treat partners when we're treating the patient with ceftriaxone and zithro. If we could use Cipro, it makes it much easier to be able to treat the partner with a uh, single dose of Cipro. So I think there's a lot of potential advantages to be able to giving uh, providers more choices. Also, obviously, if someone has a penicillin allergy or you're concerned about a cephalosporin allergy, uh, providers might feel a lot more comfortable about using a single dose of ciprofloxacin as opposed to a, uh, a beta-lactam. But at least now, making those tests available is going to require demand from clinicians, a demand from providers, and um, you know, I, I expect fairly soon uh, we will have some FDA-approved assays, and there is uh, one commercial laboratory in California which does offer uh, the test. Yeah, I think it's, it is interesting in that you have to cheat, create awareness. I mean, obviously, you've got a body of literature that you're showing right on your screen, but um, people have a tendency, it seems, even in from some of your early data about treating uh, something that's off counter or off that's not recommended in the treatment guidelines. So, um, but the ability to treat with ciprofloxacin or suffixine, they're, you know, which are not even recommended anymore in the treatment guidelines. So, um, I think it's, it's a really interesting and, and goes towards your targeted goal of, of targeted therapy and reducing the resistance to more ciprofloxacin or azithromycin issues. So uh, it's really interesting. I'm curious as to an update to treatment guidelines. Do you think that's something that will be in 2020 potentially? Yeah, so, um, the, you know, the British did update, update their guidelines to include uh, resistance-guided therapy. So the British say um, if you do a test that does show Cipro or does predict Cipro susceptibility, you may use uh, Cipro. Um, so it, it's somewhat conditional like that. So it's not saying right. Cipro is recommended. It's saying if you have a test that predicts Cipro susceptibility, use Cipro. So I think I'm optimistic, but I can't say with, with certainty that similar language will be in the um, CDC guidelines, and we expect those will come out in uh, 2020. They're usually on a five-year cycle, so it's 2019 now. We began the process. There will be a, a public um, opportunity to review the proposed changes, and, you know, we can... Um, share when that is and share information with that with the CID RAP group. And then we can also promote that um, out to participants on today's call so they can have an opportunity to review, provide feedback. And I think, um, you know, CDC is very interested in, um, you know, more of a um, engaged process with people who actually use the guidelines to, you know, help them with their clarity and recommendations. All right. How do you deal with, um, a lot of times, I, I'm thinking about when during the education process or treatment of 
I should say the education of new physicians and that are in training or uh, pharmacists or other healthcare providers, there's always this concept of you always, you treat for Neisseria and you count also co-treat with um, chlamydia. Right. So right now um, the recommendations are you need to tr co-treat uh, gonorrhea cases for chlamydia unless chlamydia has been excluded. So most of our assays are dual assays. So we'll detect both gonorrhea and chlamydia. And in some clinical settings, you can't even get a single assay. They're bundled as a dual assay. So um, if you get a result that shows chlamydia negative, you do not need to co-treat for chlamydia. Now, about half of cases do get treated empirically. People come in with symptoms, people come in with a contact, so you don't have that negative chlamydia test. And in that case, um, it is recommended that you do co-treat. But if we want you know, better antimicrobial stewardship and control of our antibiotic usage to reduce continued emergence of resistance, you know, ideally we want people treated on the basis of test results. And one approach to that, which we are seeing, are, is point of care uh, testing for STI. So now in some major uh, STD clinics in Florida and Fort Lauderdale, recently opened up in New York City at Chelsea, they actually have um, the laboratory machines in the clinic and in 90 minutes, people can get their test results. And um, a lot of providers and patients are more than willing to wait 90 minutes for the actual test result to know what they should be treated for. That's excellent. So it's probably something that will continue to expand over time that you can have the diagnostics help guide the appropriate antibiotic prescribing. Yes, and I think that's uh, very important. So I see some uh, questions in the chat, so I just want to yep. cover that. Yeah, please do. So one is um, the must-read publication. So I would say that's this brief report in clinical infectious diseases. Um, I like actually to be brief, so <laughs> it's about a 1,500-word uh, report which, which describes the introduction of the assay um, and the outcomes. And I think that kind of implementation study is probably the most relevant for clinicians and clinician advocates who wanna get their laboratories to um, bring on these uh, tested. And then the next question is, you know, one of the three, gonorrhea is one of three bacteria CDC mentioned for drug resistance. So is the same strategy being used for C. diff and CRE? So, um, you know, drug resistance for uh, C. diff is a little bit more complicated. And I would say, you know, the use of hospital-based rapid PCR testing for C. diff and, you know, waiting for the C. diff test result, yes, no, is our current approach without knowing exactly um, in terms of susceptibility. And it's still a little bit elusive to know if a C. diff infection is more susceptible to the different you know, recommended treatments, whether it be metronidazole or vancomycin or adapamycin. Um, CRE, um, the actual, that is somewhat yes. So um, there are rapid molecular assays that are used in uh, some hospital settings that same day, you can learn from the molecular susceptibility testing which of these unusual um, resistance mutations is occurring in the E. coli or the Klebsiella that can help guide therapy before the 24 to 48 hour um, phenotypic you know, antimicrobial susceptibility result is available. And historically, we've also seen that with Staph aureus and in some larger hospitals, in my hospital I work at UCLA Health, um, as, someone, as soon as someone has a positive Staph aureus uh, culture, they can tell me if there's presence or absence of the MECA gene um, to know if it's gonna be um, you know, methicillin susceptible or, or not. Um, so we are seeing you know, more use of that, and as an infectious disease specialist, you know, it's part of what we teach and what we learn and how to interpret those test results. Um, you know, the, I think some of the challenge is getting it out of the hands of the specialists into um, generalists and hospitalists and primary care providers. Yeah, 
Thank you for addressing those questions. Um, to finish it out the webinar, uh, thank you. Um, to finish out the webinar, uh, I do have a question related to, you talked about the, the gyre PCR test as well as the, um, the PENA. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other, uh, as a multiplex that you use now in the laboratory, uh, are there other add-ons that you're looking towards? Um, is it the ricin to be added or some other? Yeah, resistance? so probably, uh, there's probably at least two more. So one is azithromycin, and um, azithromycin or macrolides are a bit complicated uh, because the Nicer gonorrhea actually has multiple um, relevant genes. So the azithromycin um, resistance is conferred in the 23S ribosomal RNA gene, and um, there are multiple copies of that gene. So if it's all wild type, then there's susceptibility. But if one, two, three, or four of those genes are mutated, there can be various levels of resistance. So there is a great assay um, in mycoplasma genitalium. And you know, I'd love to give another talk in the future on mycoplasma genitalium, which is an emerging infection. And there's new recommendations about how to treat and how to uh, screen for it. But um, SpeedX has a mycoplasma genitalium resistance assay, um, which will predict whether the infection will be susceptible to azithromycin um, or not. And in mycoplasma genitalium, which as people may know is a very small bacterium, there's only one gene. So it's um, a lot easier than larger um, uh, bacteria like, like Neisseria gonorrhea or uh, E. coli, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And then for gonorrhea, um, there's a new antibiotic um, that's being developed with support from WHO um, and the GARDP called Zolifidacin. And there was a New England Journal of Medicine report last year on the success of Zolifidacin for the treatment of gonorrhea. And there's a lot of excitement about that new antibiotic. And there's also a lot of interest in preserving the efficacy of that antibiotic and trying to use that antibiotic in combination with resistance guided therapy. So um, because that antibiotic has never been used, because it has a novel mechanism of action, there's actually zero resistance out there uh, that is present. But we have some idea from the laboratory how resistance might occur, might develop. So it would be very smart if there was a um, resistance assay that could be used if not only for monitoring um, in terms of surveillance, but also potentially for treatment that um, could, could be um, embedded into that. And as you know, our kind of understanding of microbial genetics grows, as our um, ability to develop a multiplex laboratory assay grows, as we're able to query more genes in arrays and different mechanisms and use um, rapid sequencing, um, techniques with nanopore technology and some other very cool stuff that's forthcoming. You know, we're in this molecular revolution now for um, bacterial genomics. Um, you know, we will be seeing um, more data and, um, you know, a better ability to give more directed therapy for the, uh, these types of infections. I think that's a great way to close it out. Uh, just the, the importance of as new antibiotics come onto the market that you could also have the diagnostics test uh, available for targeted therapy as well as surveillance. And I also like your comment about mycoplasma genitalium. It's definitely something that we would love to uh, feature again in another webinar as it's, it's an important topic. Uh, I just uh, open it back up to you, Dr. Klausner, for any um, closing remarks before I close it out here for the webinar. Uh, no, I appreciate everyone's interest in this area. This is an emerging uh, area of uh, new data, and you know we're excited to be able to help and uh, contribute to this you know challenge of addressing antimicrobial resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is unfortunately increasing in the United States. Um, CDC has not released the 2018 data yet, but we'll expect probably another 20% increase, which will mean nearly a doubling of cases um, over the past uh, five years. And it's a big challenge. It's a challenge to our 
very limited and underfunded public health infrastructure. So um, get out there and vote and vote early and vote often. Correct. I, I think too, as you were talking, it makes me think that it's very important to educate the public about this because they could be the drivers of requesting a particular test mm -hmm. if they uh, have this diagnosis so they can get appropriately treated mm -hmm. as well as their partners. So I really appreciate your time. I'm going to um, conclude the, our antimicrobial stewardship project webinar today and just remind everyone it's recorded and will be available on our website. It's to thank Dr. Klausner for his time very busy person and appreciate your all your efforts to get the uh, new, new guidelines some of these changes incorporated um, and then from our end just to thank Maya Peters she's a part of our SIDREP ASP team in the production of the webinar and then thank you the attendees for, for participating with us today and you feel free to send us your ideas for our next webinar topics as well we'd love to hear from you thank you Dr. Klausner all right you're welcome have a great day everybody